Today's class finishes the book of Acts. We'll be looking at chapters 27 and 28, which discuss Paul's voyage to Rome as a prisoner and a few things that occurred after his arrival there. Chapter 27 tells about roughly 95% of the voyage to Rome and about a shipwreck that they encountered on, or that, that occurred uh, on, on a small island south of the Italian peninsula as they tried to make their way to Rome. In chapter 27 and verse 1, we notice the use of the pronoun we, which lets us know that Luke himself was with Paul on this voyage to, to the city of Rome. The first few verses of chapter 27 tells us, tell us that Paul, along with some other prisoners, were going to be taken to Italy. The ship departed from Caesarea. Let me get a map up here. There it is. Um, they departed from Caesarea and, and sailed some 60 to 70 miles up the coastline and stopped at Sidon there. And we're told that because uh, of the winds that blew from the west and the northwest at this time of year, the weather was not good for sailing toward the west. So they chose to sail the ship north of the island of Cyprus. You see here, instead of going underneath it directly west, they chose to, to sail this route and um, sail north of the island of Cyprus and along the coastline of Cilicia and Pamphylia un until they came to Myra, which is right here. They transferred the prisoners to another ship, which was headed for Italy and again followed the coastline of Asia Minor here uh, and until they got to Snidus right there. But instead of harboring there for the winter, they decided to press on and they traveled south to the island of Crete, which is the, the island here. And um, they reached a small bay on the southeast island uh, uh, on the southeastern edge of the of the island, and it was called Fair Havens, right here. It was not a good port to spend the winter in, but Paul urged them not to continue the voyage because it was no longer a safe time of year to sail. There's a reference that, that helps us out with that understanding in verse 9 when it refers to the fast. It mentions the fast. This, this is a reference to the Jewish Day of Atonement, which would be in our months of late September or early October. Beginning on September 15th, as I understand, sailing was considered to be inadvisable because of the dangers involved. And after November 11th, all sailing ceased until winter was over, which was around March. On three occasions in this chapter, Paul speaks to the men on the ship. His advice in verses 10 does not seem to me to be inspired. It just seems like wise judgment on his part. However, he claims inspiration in the second speech in verses 21 through 26, where he gives advice regarding what they should do. Then he reminds them of the accuracy of his prophecy, and he gave God the credit for it. Uh, he reminds them of this in verses 30 and 31 of this chapter. But regardless, the captain did not listen to Paul's advice back in chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, and it resulted in the loss of the ship and the cargo, even though there were, however, no lives lost. In verse 38, Luke mentioned that they threw the wheat out into the sea. Back in verse 27, uh, it, it, he mentioned that they were drawing near to some land and they kept checking the depth of the water out of fear of running up on rocks. The purpose in throwing out the wheat was to lighten the ship so it would ride higher in the shallow water and get as close as possible to the beach. Chapter 28 records where they have shipwrecked. They've, they've uh, come, uh, come ashore on this little island called Malta. Some translations may render it Melita. It's over here just um, south of, of, the, of Sicily, the Italian peninsula right here, this little island, if you can see the map. Uh, it's that little island, whether you can see the map or not. But uh, 
Anyway, in chapter 28, verse 2, depending upon your translation, the people of the island of Malta were called barbarians or natives or maybe even foreigners. The word native or barbarian is a word which signifies someone who speaks a foreign language. That's the fundamental idea of it. With the passing of time, it came to denote any foreigner who did not speak the Greek language and was unfamiliar with Greek culture. But this passage, the first several verses, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, this passage tells how Paul was bitten by a poisonous serpent while gathering sticks for a fire. The locals, the natives, saw it happen, and they determined that Paul must have been an evil man who had managed to escape the sea, but justice would not allow him to live, so they were expecting him to die. However, when Paul didn't suffer any harm, the people changed their minds and drew the conclusion that he was a god. Well, as a little time passed, Paul healed the father of a prominent citizen of the island, and after this, others who had diseases came to Paul and were healed. Chapter 28, verses 11 through 15, mentions the fact that another ship had wintered in the island, and once the weather improved, they sailed in that ship to finish their journey. Several cities are mentioned as they made their way north. They left the island here, made their way up to Syracuse, then hopped, if you will, on up to Regium, and then went across uh, here to uh, Puteoli, Puteoli, I guess is how you pronounce that. And Paul mentions that at that location they found brethren there, Christians, and stayed with them for seven days before going on to Rome. Then verses 16 through 31. Tell us about Paul in Rome. We see the pronoun we again and the, the arrival at Rome. And let me look up the map. Of course, you can just follow it on up here. There's, there's Rome. And that's where they finally, um, finally arrived. And, um, I, I mentioned the pronoun we again in, in verse 16 when they arrived there. It's understood that Paul wrote several letters from Rome while he was imprisoned there. Philemon and Colossians were two of those, possibly uh, Ephesians is understood and, and possibly Philippians as well, but both Philemon and Colossians mention that Luke was with Paul when he wrote those letters, which that would be understandable as we just noted, and it's commonly accepted that Paul wrote them while he was in prison at Rome here on this occasion. We also see that Paul was given special treatment once they arrived at Rome. We're told that he was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. This indicates that he was allowed to live in a separate house rather than in the barracks with the other prisoners. No doubt, comments about Paul's character on the voyage would have been a contributing factor to his special treatment. I'm sure the centurion spoke highly of him. Also, the letter that Festus wrote with King Agrippa's assistance uh, or at least input, uh, that, that letter would have mentioned that Paul had not been convicted of any crime and that he would have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. I'm sure these were all factors in Paul's special treatment. Verse 17 tells us that three days later, after they arrived at Rome, Paul met with the leaders of the Jews in Rome. He explained the reason why he was in prison there. They expressed a desire to hear about what they called this sect that is spoken against everywhere. And verse 23 tells us that they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day, and they came in large numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God, and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about, about Jesus. Then verse 24 says, some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Paul then quoted from what we know as Isaiah chapter 6. This passage makes it clear that the gospel is a message that can be understood. If it's not understood or if it's rejected, it's because the ones who are hearing have grown hard of hearing and they've closed their eyes. This reminds me of a warning Paul gave on his first missionary journey to those in Antioch of Pisidia in Acts chapter 13. He quoted there in uh, from Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 5 and he said behold you despisers this is after he preached to, to them and 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 talked to them about Christ being the savior and he's the one spoken of by the prophets and 
and that his resurrection was foretold by the prophets. Then he said, I don't recall that verse right off the top of my head. It's it's around the uh, latter, the late 30s, I believe, 36, 37, 38, somewhere along there. Uh, he said, Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. The following Sabbath, in that same chapter, Acts 13, some of those Jews were filled with envy, and they contradicted and blasphemed the things spoken by Paul. And Paul then told them that he preached the word of God to them, but that they had rejected it, and that they had judged themselves to be unworthy of everlasting life. The responsibility of accepting or rejecting the gospel lays at the feet of the individual, each individual who hears it. And that's what Isaiah is talking about there in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 that Paul quotes at the latter part of Acts chapter 28. The book of Acts ends by telling us that, in verses 30 and 31, for two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. It's generally accepted that Paul was released from prison after this and enjoyed a period of freedom, but that he was imprisoned in Rome again a second time. It's understood that this second imprisonment ended in his execution by beheading. And that execution seems to be anticipated in the second letter to Timothy, which is understood to have been written during Paul's second Roman imprisonment. There are a variety of drawbacks to this method of teaching, but I hope that you've gained some benefit from this journey through the book of Acts.